Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 234, featuring the second installment of my interview with Mrs. Brenda Romero. This part of the interview, we focus in on the Jagged Alliance and Wizardry series, including a story about her mentor, David Bradley. A lot of great stuff to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mrs. Brenda Romero. So you did the technical communications thing in college, right? And then you interviewed at IBM, is my understanding, and they... You sort of had an uh, epiphany at that moment when you found out what they wanted you to do, right? Uh, I did, man. You've done your research. So I, um, yeah, I remember vividly. I, I even remember, like, there were moments in our lives, I think, that are so vivid. We remember exactly where we were standing, exactly what we were wearing, the whole thing. Um, and I was coming around this corner. I, so I got it, you know, I, going through what you do in college, and I, you know, I, get, the, I get some interviews, and one of which was at, at IBM in Atlanta. And... At my interview, I, you know, I just remember we're walking around this corner and the interview seems to be going well. We walk around this corner and the, the guide says, so what you'd be, re wait, I want to make sure I get this right. So what you'd be doing is revising DOS manuals. <laughs> I thought like, oh my, I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> and mind you, like I, I actually really like computer manuals um, still, believe it or not, you know, like some of the old manuals like we have uh john's unearthing all of his old apple stuff and it's just fascinating to look at and i loved you know i loved um i loved the the manuals that came that explained what you could do with code you know because i would just learn a new command and oh interesting that's what this does and, and then i would you know screw around with it um but the thought of like revising dos manuals like what like this is this is it uh and they were offering at the time i think $25,000 more than Sir Tech was paying me, which was basically double my salary. Uh, and I remember just thinking like, I, I want to do this. And so I went back to Sir Tech and Sir Tech, you know, the guys there had been tremendously supportive of me. Um, you know, they knew this is a high school job. You know, this is an after high school job. This is what people do. And eventually they leave and then we'll, we'll bring somebody in to fill your spot. And I remember walking into Rob Saratek's office and just saying to him, he said, well, how'd the interview go? And I said, yeah, I think I just want to keep making games. And that was it. That was it. That was the, that was the end of, that was my post-college interview at Surtech, you know, and I, and then I just kept going through the ranks. Um, but yeah, that, that was it. And I just, there was no way. <laughs> Who would want to do that for a living? You know, that, Making games, I'd rather make games for half the money than pretty much anything else in this world. So when did you first start to get out of the, uh, the hotline stuff and get into uh, the other aspects of the game development? Uh, and I understand you wrote some manuals and then uh, did some testing and I guess eventually uh, was designing games or at least... The, um, I've got, there's a few things I'm kind of hazy about, <laughs> uh, but let's just uh, start there. So just kind of going from the hotline job to these... Uh, rising up through the ranks. So yeah, so I was on the hotline, um, although pretty much all the way through high school, all the way through high school, not pretty much. And when I go to college, I'm now doing a lot of product development work, you know, specifically on, you know, I, I did a lot, I did some early testing on Rescue Raiders and Cryptomedia. It was a really small company. Um, you know, even for Wizardry 7, uh, I remember everybody pitching in to to go out back, you know, where all the production stuff was and to box that game up and ship it out to make sure the orders were filled. We didn't have, we didn't, the, com the structure of the company wasn't such that, and the, the people in the company weren't such that we would say, okay, I've done, this is all I do and, you know, to hell with the rest of you. I mean, everybody, everybody pitched in with everything. So when there came an opportunity to, to do anything, when an opening appeared anywhere, if I could do it, man, I was, I was first in line for that spot. Um, you know, so like when the dude who did the manuals left, you know, like I can do that. I can write those manuals. And in fact, I started doing that before I was even out of college. Um, I think I wrote the, I think I wrote the wizardry five manual, um, before I was out of college and which, which was great because I was, you know, I was, I was already doing stuff. Uh, I was doing stuff professionally ahead of the coursework. So it made the coursework much easier for me and allowed me to continue working all the way through college. Um, and we you know, did a lot of testing um, and, then, and then also just generally managing the product development process. Like I remember with some of 
you know, Bradley's early games, uh, Wizardry, Wizardry 5, Heart of the Maelstrom, working with him just to make sure, is this thing ready to go? Is it ready to ship? Are all the bugs closed out? Um, is there anything that, that he needs? Uh, giving feedback on the game. And unbeknownst to me, I was really beginning a, um, a long distance apprenticeship uh, you know, and I've, I've repeatedly said that I, you know, I learned so much from Bradley. I was fortunate, was fortunate to be able to work on site with Robert Woodhead. Uh, you know, he was a super genius who was incredibly involved in everything he was doing. And I think some people are great for apprenticing, you know, to apprentice with rather. Um, and other people, their world is just full and they don't, they don't have room for that. But Bradley, um, he was really generous with his, uh, with his knowledge and with his uh, decisions. So I could ask him tons of questions. Why would you do that? Um, and you, know, you think about, like now I look back and this was a lead programmer. I mean, Bradley was lead programmer, lead designer. He was kind of all, you know, this, he was everything on his projects. And, and he was incredibly generous with his time. And he would answer any question that I had. I, I don't ever remember David not making time for my questions. So I learned so much, just so much from that guy. So as is the case with most game designers, I think rising up through the ranks, um, every game designer, me included, we run out of time and we don't have nearly enough time to do all the things that, uh, that we need to do. So if he had questions about some things, yeah, it was my turn to do it. And um, you know, it's my turn to I, go find the answer to this question. Go, you know, what do you think about this? Uh, and so it was just a process of, of something needs to be done. Well, you can do it. And eventually that leads to me uh, working as um, the designer on a designer on Wizardry 8. Well, so I've got that you did some work on Realms of Arcania, but I wasn't able to find exactly, you know, what that involvement was. Um, my, my involvement in Realms of Arcania is very similar to the work that I did with David um, on the on Wizardry uh, 5, 6, and 7. So it's basically just being on U.S. side. In some of them, I wrote the manual for some of them, um, but a lot of it was just you know, managing the product development process. Is this thing ready to ship? You know, basically being the publisher side. I don't, producer isn't the right word. But basically being the, you know, the publisher side person that's beating that game to death, it's making sure it's at, and not just from a QA perspective, but making sure that it's as good of a game as it can be. But those guys were great. They were super easy to work with. All right. So what about Jagged Alliance 2? Jagged Alliance was such an amazing game. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, when Jagged Alliance was released, it came out really close to XCOM, which was a really unfortunate. Nobody could, you know, we didn't see three months to go the most Herculean development task I have ever seen happen. And I remember like, I remember on my list from the producer, there was this like, I don't, I love XCOM. Um, so Jagged Alliance, yeah, I mean, that was a blast to work on. Uh, you know, and likewise, I mean, I think you learn a lot working on every project and um, Ian Curry uh, and Linda Curry. I mean, obviously Linda, the woman who got me into the industry uh, later marries Ian Curry, you know, and they go on and make a bunch of great games together. Uh, and Sean Ling, um, you know, Jagged Alliance was just a great game. Absolutely just a great game. It remains one of my favorites. I don't know if you know, but like a lot of characters in that game are based on, not a lot of characters, some of the characters in that game are based on real people. The character Buzz... There's one named Brenda, right? No, Buzz. <laughs> There's a character named Buzz Garneau, and that's me. Which I may or may not have earned. All right, so Wizardry 8, is that the first game that you were the lead designer on? Uh, yeah, you know what I should say, like, it's, it's interesting with, uh, with Wizardry 8, I mean, you know, I had worked on some other games as, um, as a designer and maybe, you know, in some cases as a sole designer, which is different than being a lead. And with Wizardry 8, what I, what I did was, um, was the, like, uh, basically if you, if you went there, like all the level design with, with very rare exception, like I left a couple levels to do. Linda always liked to do a level in a game, so we would sort of carve out this space, like, okay, this is this is your space, and and, and these hooks need to come in, and you need to make sure that you fill, take care of that, but we would basically, Linda always liked to have a space in the game. And then all the characters, and the writing for all the characters, and the whole story and world tied together, and that sort of stuff. Um, and then, uh, and we, 
we really functioned as a, a as a design team. You know, we we locked ourselves in a room. Um, me and Linda and Alex Maduna and Charles Miles um, and just you know banged out what this game was going to be like. Um, you know, combat wise, not so much not so much level design and story and all that sort of stuff and you know the larger world design, but how do how are we going to take uh, how many, however many years it was, probably 15 years at the time, how are we going to take 15 years of history and make sure that all of these players who, who have followed Wizardry since the early days, and, and there are many, obviously, how are we going to make sure that when they play Wizardry 8, that they feel like they're at home? Um, and I wanted to make sure that I tied up all the loose ends of Wizardry 6 and 7 as well. So I spent probably four or five months just researching uh, making sure, you know, like, I mean, obviously a news story, right? I played these games and, you know, I played these games until I probably could have played them asleep. Uh, but I needed to make sure that I did that. You know, I felt a, even though Bradley and, and Surtech had gone their separate ways, I felt an, a, a tremendous responsibility for the world that Bradley had built. Um, and making sure that I closed it off is, is, beautifully and succinctly as possible. I really wanted to try, I really wanted to try to be as as great as I thought Bradley was with Wizardry 7, which is a ridiculous, which is a ridiculous goal. But I, that's what I wanted to do. I, I felt like I owed it that to him. Um, and I also, you know, I, if there was one personal luxury that I took was bringing back Bella, who was one of my favorite characters from Wizardry 6. And I just wanted to make sure I closed that loop as well. <laughs> So what happened uh, with Bradley? Why, why didn't he work on Wizardry 8? Ah, uh, what happened with Bradley? Good question. Um, good question that I don't know if I even really know an answer to. Um, you know, I guess, uh, I guess legal mess, you know, I, you know, he and, he and the, he and the, the owners of Surtech fell out. Um, you know, I, it, it's one of those things, like I would say it's one of my bigger game development regrets. Um, I was, you know, I was working on Wizardry, I, was, I, was, I don't know what I was working on actually when it first happened, but I, but I remember just, you know, like, so listen, we're, I'm, I'm even trying to remember, um, so if you cut out that whole messy part, can you do that, by the way? The messy parts are the most fun, what are you talking about? Um, so... All right, so well, let me, if you don't mind, I'll start again. So what happened with uh, that? It's, I don't, I don't really. Well, I guess it was kind of bittersweet for you, right? I mean, on the one hand, you've got uh, this awesome opportunity uh, to be the lead, but at the same time, you know, you've been working with him for so long. So, it, well, I mean, it was a tremendous opportunity, and, and Surtech had actually, um, Surtech had actually worked with another outside developer uh, to to try to keep you know tr try to keep the Wizardry series going, and ultimately that was something that they didn't that didn't work out, um, you know, and 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 created some challenges in its own. Actually, so I have to pause this. Like you, this can't go on the record. So one of the things that'll happen, and I don't know how well you moderate your comments, but um, so. When Bradley left, uh, when Bradley left Surtech, and, and you know what happened there is still, thank you, is still pretty, um, is still pretty hazy for me because I wasn't on that whole side. I wasn't on the side where uh, you know he and the and the owners of uh, Surtech were having, you know, basically uh, having uh, disagreement. Uh, didn't want to work together anymore. So it, you know it was bittersweet for me because sure you know it gives me it, it gives me an opportunity to to move up to where Bradley was. But at the same time, this is my mentor. Like, you know, I, I still had tons to learn from him. Uh, and he, you know, Wizardry 7 remains one of my greatest games of all time. Um, and so, you know, I don't even know if calling it bittersweet. I, I, would, have, I would have liked to work with Bradley longer. Um, it, and what I remember of that time was David, uh, basically Surtex saying, so listen, you know, we're not going to be working with Bradley anymore. Um, and I remember, you know, basically I shouldn't contact him and, and shouldn't speak with, you know, there's no reason for me to contact him. And because what happened could, could result in legal things, you can't talk to Bradley anymore. And I guess if somebody said that to 
me of today, I would say, okay, well, I understand that there are these, there's this legal thing or potential. There's, there's some, there's some issues you guys are ironing out and that's all business related, but, but Bradley's been a friend of mine at this point for years. And so I'm not going to not talk to him. Like I, you know, I still, I still think he's uh, an incredible designer and I, and I want to be able to, to maintain a friendship relationship with him. But I was young and I, I didn't know that, you know, I didn't know that that was something that I, I just didn't know. And so to this day, from that moment, I've still never spoken with David Bradley. Um, you know, and not because I don't want to, you know, I, I don't know. I've, on a couple of occasions, I've reached out to him and I, and I haven't heard back from him. And I don't know whether that's just a, a fluke. Um, but I, but I still think, you know, even though I played D and D, even though I um, played a hell of a lot of board games, even though I had an opportunity to work with Arthur Burdo and the guys who did Jagged Alliance and um, and Robert Woodhead, even though I had an opportunity to literally be there at the very beginning, it was the stuff that I learned from David Bradley. It was those, it was the time spent working on mostly Wizardry Six and Wizardry Seven that really showed me. Uh, what it meant to be a game designer, even if he was in Atlanta and I was in New York. You know, I, I, I was very fortunate to have a front row seat to somebody creating what many consider still to be, you know, the, the height of old school um, hardcore RPGs. And Wizardry 7 was a masterpiece. And I, I had a front row seat. I saw how that thing was put together. Um, and so I, so I still regret that. I mean, that 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 is... You know that if if uh, if every game designer has one lament, you know that's mine. All right, I have a couple of related questions here about Wizardry 8, which, uh, by the way, I think is a really awesome game. I just covered it in a match out episode fairly recently. Uh, so anyway, Patrick Estran uh, wants to know if you had plans for more Wizardry games uh, after Surtek went bankrupt, and uh, uh, Gabor Domjohn wants to know about the unreleased Wizardry 8 Stones of Arnhem. So, um, okay, so the first question, plans for more wizardry. So somebody else has got the IP now. Um, and after, after working on 20 years of swords, man, I needed something without a sword in it. And that was even part of the reason that I started working uh, with the guys on the Jagged Alliance series, because I would say, like, listen, I just need, I need to get out of the dungeon. <laughs> it's something, I need a gun. I need something with a gun. I need, I need a, a, a world where humans exist like just humans exist. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so after 20 years, I was like, man, I'm just, I'm tired of it. I, I'm just tired of RPGs. But every once in a while, I, I really have a desire to make, uh, to make, I don't know whether it's a wizardry game, but I suppose since that's the, R, those are the RPGs that I made for years and years and years, that it sure as hell would be something like that. Um, but like I said, I, I don't have the IP. Somebody else bought the IP, so it's not like I could go make a wizardry game anyway. Um, but I, I would find it near impossible to turn down the opportunity to work on one. I, I, just, I just know I would. I mean, I can't, I can't imagine if that, if that happened to me that I would say, like, oh, no, by all means, somebody else go do it. You know, I mean, it's, you know, it's my childhood. Wizardry, in a sense, is my hometown. You know, I spent 20 years there, for God's sakes. You know, now, because I'm getting old, it's less than half of my life, but it was more than half of my life. I mean, it's 20 years, right? Um, Stones of Arnhem, Stones of Arnhem was a, um, uh, it was, Stones of Arnhem was going to be the sequel to uh, Wizardry 7. Um, well, I don't know if it was a sequel to Wizardry 7, but it was the next, it was the next, um, it was the next game in line after Wizardry 7 was done. Um, and it was done in Australia and Surtech ended up opting not to publish it, um, and I don't think that I don't think the development ever got. Uh, you know, at that point in time, I was m more involved in other product development, um, other games that they were doing. So I don't actually know the total reason for the cut, but they decided not to go forward with uh, and finish the development on it, and so it didn't get released. Yeah, I was just thinking about these wizardry games now. I think it isn't it in Japan somewhere now. They're still making those. It's got to be possible for us to get the IP back, right? Because <laughs> well, I don't know what they're doing, but it's not as good as it could be. 
Um, you know, it's interesting. I haven't played. I haven't played any Wizardry games since Wizardry Eight. Um, I have played. You know, I've played around with. Uh, you know, interestingly enough, I've you know I've gone back and done the, the Wizardry One emulators just because it's fun and because I can still I can make it almost all the way unless I get I can make it. I could make it through that dungeon if there were no monsters still with my eyes closed. I'm positive if you gave me graph paper, I can draw, pick a level, I can draw the level. Um, but yeah, I don't know, you know, the series, the series has taken on for sure a life of its own over in Japan. Um, and I know that they recently came out with Wizardry Online. Uh, you know, and games have changed a lot since then too, right? So, you know, most of my design for RPGs was for single player RPGs where you take a party of characters down into a dungeon. And design has changed a lot. You know, I remember when Diablo first came out and we all thought, wow, that's that's really kind of a role playing dash L I T E, you know, like it's this is just this is way easier. Like, geez, I wonder if if, if they're missing so much here, but who knew that that Amen. Huh? <laughs> I said amen to that. Yeah. Um, you know, they were, they were, there was so much detail that wasn't there that could be there. And, you know, wow, how great. Like Diablo, I, I have credited Diablo many times in saving, you know, saving my profession because RPG design, like we were watching the old series one by one, they were dropping, you know. Uh, and so if you were an RPG designer, good luck to you. And then Diablo came out and everybody played it. And suddenly everybody loved RPGs. And it's like, yay, we get another 20 year run. We'll be able to work, so, you know. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it, was, it was an interesting time. RPGs have changed a lot though, like I said. So, you know, I, I don't know, but the wizardry, the IP is, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's over in Japan somewhere. That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with part three of my interview with Brenda. And there's a lot of great stuff coming up, including my favorite part of the interview. So stay tuned. A lot of great stuff coming up, believe me. As always, I want to thank you very, very, very much, guys, if you have supported this show. Really appreciate it, guys. You can uh, support me on Patreon, in which case you'll get a, a Patreon-only audio podcast, uh, a little monthly special for you guys. Uh, but anything you can do to support the show, guys, uh, I really appreciate it. Also appreciate all of you who have been uh, tweeting about the show or sharing the links to the shows on all the various social media. Uh, thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate it. Now, what about that ale of the week? Well, <laughs> Uh, this week I've got a uh, one from the Hebrew, uh, the Chosen Beer uh, Brewer. They're out of Saratoga Springs, New York. The uh, actually the Schmaltz Brewing Company. Um, really, I have a they have a, a stellar reputation, but uh, this one really caught my eye. It's a, a double doppel called the Rejuvenator, <laughs> with you spelled J E W. Eight um, percent alcohol by volume, and they've got a you know, a pretty lengthy write-up on the bottle here, which I thought I would uh, just read this in lieu of the usual quotation. There's actually quite a few fun quotations uh, uh, mixed in with this. So, how better to celebrate the evolution of the year than with re recipes inspired by generations of the original craft brew warriors, the monks? Yeah, how do you not want to drink this already? Uh, top with a healthy dose of schmaltz and witness the rebirth of Rejuvenator. And then here's the first quote. Uh, the winter of bondage has passed. The deluge of suffering is gone. The fig tree has formed its first fruits, declaring all ready for libation. Apparently that's from the Song of Solomon, right out of the Bible. Uh, dates were used to sweeten beer in ancient Egypt as early as 3500 BCE. Uh, that I did not know. Uh, Genesis 3-7. Their eyes were opened and they knew that they were naked. <laughs> They sewed fig leaves and made themselves aprons. <laughs> uh, Queen Vic commissioned an 18-inch platter fig leaf for her cast of Michelangelo's David. Uh, the statue that advertises its modesty with a fig leaf brings its modesty under suspicion. Uh, Mark Twain. Uh, under a fig tree, Romulus and Remus, mythical founders of Rome, were nursed by a she-wolf and worlds away Buddha found enlightenment. Uh, Zechariah. The nations shall beat their swords into plowshares. All will sit with their neighbor under a fig tree, never afraid. Uh, Mohammed. 
Uh, whoever eats seven tamer dates at breakfast shall rise above magic and poison that day. Uh, the Hebrew word for date poem, Tamar, connotes a woman's grace. The only difference between a first date and a job interview is not many job interviews have a chance you'll end up naked. <laughs> uh, Jerry Seinfeld. And then they uh, end here with the uh, Psalms 92 through 12. The righteous shall flourish like the date palm. Thankfully, all we need to do is pop open a bottle and rejoice. Uh, something. Whew, quite a write up. You know, if, somebody, if they put even half as much thought into the brew and the taste of this thing as they did all of the text, I think we're in for a real treat. So let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this rejuvenator here in the rather excellent and very rejuvenating drinking horn. Been smelling it. You can definitely smell those fruits they added. I think it was dates and, uh, and uh, figs. Definitely uh, smelling those. I hope they didn't get carried away with it and put uh, too much in. That's about all I could smell. Uh, maybe a little bit of the hops. Uh, but that fruitiness is definitely uh, overpowering uh, the, the rest of the uh, aromas coming off of this thing. So let's give it a taste. That's sort of bitter uh, when you first drink it, but then you get all of these uh, fruity sort of aftertastes. It's very, uh, um, it is, you know, in fact, quite rejuvenating. A lot of uh, flavors springing forth right now in my uh, mouth and throat, kind of... Uh, the figs and the dates, uh, there's no mistaking those. Kind of a, a little bit of a prune juice-like flavor to this. You, you almost, every time you think it's gonna get bitter though, it kind of sweetens itself out somehow. It's a very unusual and very complicated uh, experience here. Let me try it again. Yeah, it's, it's uh, surprisingly not very sweet, like considering the figs and dates. Uh, you taste them, but really what you're tasting more of is a sort of uh, a prune juice-like uh, flavor. It's uh, hard to describe it exactly, but it's not bad. I'll just try it one more time. Yeah, very complicated and uh, sophisticated flavors here. Uh, I guess if you like dates and you like uh, <laughs> figs and prunes, I would throw in, uh, you'll like this. It doesn't really taste like that uh, anything that I would consider to be like a Belgian double. Uh, so the, you know, the fruit flavors, I guess, have a blast of that uh, taste right out of the water. Uh, but it's still uh, definitely drinkable and definitely enjoyable. I guess with the old drinking horn scale, I'm going to go three out of five drinking horns on this. If you want something uh, different, or if you really happen to like uh, figs and dates, I think this would be a good choice. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot more uh, doubles out there that I prefer over this one. So, anyway, Rejuvenator, three out of five drinking horns. I'll see you guys next week. Now you're on this. I hope we're going to have some gratuitous sex and violence. I certainly hope so, too. <laughs>